Today we are back in our sermon series looking at discipleship and uh, it's, it's one thing where, I mean, I actually looked back over um, all of the sermons that we've preached at City Light over the last 12 years and we have very little that are titled or specifically about the topic of discipleship and yet it is throughout uh, most of the sermons really includes something about the gospel and the centrality of Jesus and about what does it look like or mean to be a disciple. And we haven't really done a, a series specifically just saying, hey, this is what a disciple is. And so I got me thinking, oh man, it's possible that someone who's been around City Light for a little while, uh, possibly even hearing us talk about discipleship groups, which are the key and core unit of what we do as a church, and hear us talk about discipleship and read scriptures about discipleship, might actually go, I don't even really know what, what is a disciple. What does it mean to be a disciple? And so today, in fact, this month we've been looking at, what does it mean to be a disciple? And, and today we're going to be looking at what does it mean to be a disciple maker? So you as someone who disciples other people. And this might be an, a terrifying thing for some of you. And for others, it might be a really aspirational thing where you think, yeah, one day down the track, when I am more mature, when I'm older, when I've got my life figured out, that's when I'll be able to start making disciples. Then, sometime then. And, and, and you might think, you know, maybe five or ten years' time, but then in five years' time, you're thinking, five or ten more years' time. And then five years pass again, and you think, I'm, gonna, I'm definitely going to need another five or ten years' time. We look at what does it look like? How do you get started? How do you grow in disciple making? What does it look like to be intentional, relational, and multiplying? You might ask, you, you might ask yourself the question, you might even be today going, yeah, I am, I'm all about it. I want to make disciples. How do I know if I'm making disciples? What does that look like? What's the measure of discipleship? We've heard it a little bit today already. Uh, at, at City Light, we are family, we are worshippers, we're missionaries, we're learners, and we're lovers. And so we look at what does it mean to be a disciple? It means to grow in Christ-likeness using those measures. How do we know we're becoming more like Jesus? Well, we are family like he has made us family. We worship him in spirit and in truth. We are missionaries about his work in the world. And not Missionary is not just somebody overseas who abstracts themselves from their culture, but missionary is every person who's on the mission of God, here or somewhere else, making disciples here, making disciples there. Uh, we are learners. We love to learn, to study scripture, to grow in the knowledge and the love of Jesus, to see him, um, to, to see him made known, both to us and to others, and then we're lovers. Like he commanded us to love one another just like he loved us. We had to love one another. And so we want to grow in love to show that we're his disciples. He even says in John 13, 35, by your love, everyone will know that you're my disciples. And so these are the things that we're going to, these are the, the ways that we measure our disciple making. And then we're also going to look today about how do we measure that? Because discipleship is not measured in days and weeks. Discipleship is not something that we go, oh, I, uh, you know, I, 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 am, I look back over the last two months and I just haven't been able to grow in this particular area, but rather discipleship is made in months and years and decades. And so we don't want to get frustrated in doing good or give up in doing good, uh, but to keep going. And then we're also going to ask, how am I personally growing as a disciple? And we're going to do it all in 25 minutes. So let's pray, we'll get stuck into some scripture, and we'll see what God would have for us. So Father, firstly, thank you for your son Jesus. Thank you for, for, for who he is and what he's done, what that means for us. You're so good to us, God. Thank you for relating to us as a father, and, and we as your daughters and your sons. And so we come to you today as our father, as father as your children, asking you for your help to understand your scriptures. 
that we become more like your son, Jesus? Filled by and in step with and attentive to your Holy Spirit, speaking to us and ministering, ministering to us and working through us? And that in every way you would be glorified with our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I did want to say as well, Ollie, when Walt was pointing in this direction, when he said socially awkward, he wasn't talking about you personally. He was just, this is what preachers do, they just point in a direction. <clears throat> just in case you're wondering about it and gone, just so you could hear. Anyway, how do we make disciples? Let's have a look at some disciple makers. So way, way back in the day, uh, we, we, we spent a year looking through the book of Acts and following the journey of uh, the early apostles, and then Paul, and then he, he kind of collected a, a, a small group of people that he would uh, roll with. So Paul and Timothy and Silas were three guys. Paul, kind of the father figure. Timothy and Silas, he, he even calls them like his spiritual sons. And Paul was discipling Timothy and Silas, and Paul, Timothy and Silas together were discipling churches as they would plant churches. And so they were based in a church in Antioch, a little bit north of Jerusalem. And from Antioch, they would go out and, and make disciples, obeying Jesus' command, the newly resurrected Jesus who gathered his disciples and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So you see the beginning of John, John says he had all the authority. And then at the end of Matthew, he says, all authority has been given to me. I've done it. It says, go, therefore, because of this, because of the authority that I have, which is complete and total, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And I'll be with you forever. And so we have this example of Paul and Timothy and Silas. Paul himself was a disciple of Barnabas. So you see Barnabas discipling Paul, Paul discipling Timothy and Silas, and together they go around planting churches and making more disciples. And at one stage, they write to some of the, ch some of the churches that they've planted, uh, and, and in one case, they write to the church in Thessalonica. So I'm going to read a couple of excerpts from, this, um, from chapter 2 of 1 Thessalonians. And I want you to consider Paul and Timothy and Silas. Hear how they love this church. Hear how they love these people. Hear the nature of their disciple making. How did they go about making disciples in Thessalonica? Let's have a look. Verse 7, he says, We were gentle among you as a nurse nurtures her own children. Verse 11, As you know, like a father with his own children, we encouraged, comforted, and implored each one of you to walk worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. You were, we were like a mum. We were like a dad. We were like parents because we are family. Verse 8, this is where we're going to spend most of our time today. It said, We cared so much for you that we were pleased to share with you not only the gospel of God, so they shared the word with these disciples, but also our lives. So they weren't just teachers, they were fathers and mothers. They were living with these people. They shared not just what they knew, but they shared themselves. And they go on. For you remember, oh sorry, because you had become dear to us. For you remember our labour and hardship, brothers and sisters, working night and day so that we would not burden any of you. We preach God's gospel to you. And so we hear here some foundational disciple making. Sharing the word, sharing the life, sharing our knowledge, what we know, sharing the gospel, sharing the scriptures, and sharing our very lives. So for Paul, Timothy, and Silas, this meant, and we know this from Acts, we know this from history, they lived among the church, worked alongside these disciples. They denied themselves certain rights that they had as apostles. Denied themselves um, privileges that they might otherwise have been able to do. They opened up their hearts, opened up their thoughts, opened up their affections, opened up their homes. And then they went into the homes of the Thessalonians. 
They were really doing that life on life, like that integrated family style love. Where they call them brothers and sisters. They call themselves like a mom or like a dad. And this is the foundation of discipleship. Discipleship cannot happen really at a, at a distance or it's, it's far superior to do discipleship up close. There may be some times where you know, discipleship of a distance is necessary, uh, but they, the way that Paul, Timothy and Silas practice discipleship over a distance is they write a letter to remind them of how they lived among them. They were a small community living inside a larger community. Again, they were living out that John 13, 34, 35. Loved one another with the love that Jesus had for them so that everyone would know that they belonged to Jesus. We, I was going to say we hate this. We don't hate this. I think we long for this in Australia in 2024, but we suck at it. I think we long for it. We long for this kind of community. We, we want mums and dads, someone to help us, to come into our lives and say, you're doing a good job. I'm, pr- I'm proud of you. Or what are you thinking? We long for brothers and sisters who can you know, be arm in arm, shoulder to shoulder, working towards a common goal, encouraging one another, pointing each other to Jesus. But at the same time, we have crowded that kind of life, the kind of family out of our lives. We become suspicious of it. Uh, we don't want to sacrifice. Like the things that Paul and Timothy and Silas say to this church in Thessalonica, I can say it's through hardships and through labor we opened up our lives to you. We don't, we, I think it's one of the deepest desires of every human heart is that kind of community. We're built for it. We're made for it. God has designed us this way. He's created us for this. But there's this barrier between where we are and there which is the opening up our lives, opening up our hearts, taking down like the veil, the mask over this kind of carefully curated projection of how we want the world to think of us, our social media profile or, or whatever, however that wants to, however that looks for you. And so it's too costly to bridge that gap. We all long for it. I really believe it. We all long for it but we're not willing to, do, to overcome this to get to it. It's too costly. It's too costly for me to open up my life so that a mum or a dad might speak into my life. What if I'm rejected? What if they tell me something that I don't want to hear? What if my, the trajectory of my life is leading to destruction And they want to save me from that destruction, but I'm not willing because this is where I want to go. What if they want me to do hard work and open up my life to others like they're opening up their lives to to me? But I, I like being comfortable. I want that, but not enough to overcome my desire for comfort. Sometimes it's just easier to kind of get on and go, yeah, that would be lovely, but who... That's an unrealistic pipe dream. Sure, we're we're created for it, but who can overcome this gap? Am I way off or is this resonating? Okay. So it's uncomfortable to open up our, our lives to someone who could disciple us, but it's also uncomfortable to open up our lives to people that we would disciple because as we look at the example of Jesus who lived with these, t- these 12 people Disciples, and many more, mind you, more like 70 or 150 disciples that he was traveling with, 12 apostles, many, many more disciples. He opened up his life to them. He lived with them. He ate with him. He taught them as he went. And he revealed more and more of himself to them as they grew in him. I mean, he was fully man, but he was also fully God. And so he didn't just kind of open up the floodgates and let them have it. Uh, because he, you know, he, he's good and, and, and wise. And Paul likewise, and Timothy and Silas, they lived with these people for years and worked with them and ate with them and grieved with them and celebrated with them. They did the hard work. 
to open up your thinking to somebody else, to open up your actions to somebody else, to open up your struggles to somebody else, to talk about your sin to somebody else. This is the, this is the hard work. This is the gap. It's terrifying. But I'll put it to you and I'll show you from Scripture. It is wonderfully liberating to walk over that bridge and get to that community. By God's grace, we have, we have, I was going to say pockets, but it's more than pockets of that community here at City Light. And it is, it's wonderful. Uh, so most people tend to be okay with opening up about a former struggle. So yeah, I, I came through this dark time. Uh, so I had this dark time and I came through it and now I'm all better. Few people are willing, as, as a disciple maker or as someone with a disciple, with a disciple to say, I am currently going through a difficult time and I need help. Or to say to somebody, um, look, look at my life. You can copy how I live. Like the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 13 says, consider those who spoke the word of God to you. I think, remember them. Uh, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. So the writer of Hebrews is saying, look at those people who have discipled you. Consider what they taught you. Consider how they lived. Go and do likewise. Or like Paul says a couple of times, you can be just like me. This is a Don paraphrase. He says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. He says, you can be just like me. What does it mean to be a disciple maker? It means to say to somebody else or bodies else, you can be just like me. Again, it's terrifying. And, you might, and this is where we get to the point where we go, yeah, someday in the future, in five or ten years' time, I will have my life together enough to say to somebody, you can be just like me. Or you can imitate me. I don't think that's what I don't think that's what Paul is trying to say. Because if we do that, we never get there. You will never have your life together enough. It won't happen. And if you if we all just wait until that magical day, zero disciple making. When I was a youth pastor like 20 years ago, the number one complaint amongst young people and young adults in particular was nobody has taught us. Nobody's shown us. How are we supposed to know how to make disciples when we haven't been discipled? How are we supposed to know how to be grown-ups when we have no grown-ups to look, out, look, look into? Obviously, that wasn't necessarily true. There were lots of grown-ups around, but there weren't lots of grown-ups. Should I stop saying the word grown-ups? There were not lots of mature Christians who were saying to these people, you can be just like me. Let me, know, let me open up my thoughts to you and teach you how to think or at least show you the outcome of my thinking. Let me open up my faith to you and show you the outcome of my faith. Let me, let me open up my finances to you so you can see my finances to let me show you the outcome of how I spend my money. Let me open up my home to you so you can see how I love my husband, wife, kids, dog, etc. They were saying we didn't have that. How are we supposed to go and do it when we haven't even seen it? And so I'd have to say every kind of five years as a new cohort of young adults came up and they all said the same thing. I had to say, well, we need to draw a line in the sand and say the next generation will not have this problem. But what's happened in the last 20 years? Many of those young adults have gone on to become those mature adults with kids and you know, responsible jobs and whatnot who are themselves not making disciples. And so again... Generation coming up saying, where, where are my examples? Where are the dads? Where are the mums? Sharing your life isn't just serving others. It really is about participating in the family of Jesus. You are a daughter. You are a son if you're in Christ. You're a daughter of God. You're a son of God. He's, he's adopted you into his family. So the question isn't, are you a son or are you a daughter? But it's, how are you living as one in the family of Jesus? What does it look like to be a brother or sister? What does it look like to be a mother or a father? It, I mean, again, it's a really scary thing to say, follow me as I follow Jesus. But what you're not saying is, I've got my life together. 
What you're not saying is I'm perfect. What you're not saying is uh, if you do what I do, your life will turn out awesome. What you're saying is come and I'm going to put down any pretense, any mask, come and see it all, all the good, all the bad, all the struggle, all the sin. Let me show you how I repent when I'm an idiot. Let me show you how I fall and run to Jesus. Let me show you how I, when I do well, how I celebrate without growing in pride, but rather growing in humility and giving God the glory. This is how we do life together. This is how we make disciples. It's not about you saying, carbon copy me in my perfection. You're saying, carbon copy me in my faith, in how I trust in Jesus, in how I apply the gospel in my life, in how I worship him as king and as sovereign over my life and over the universe. This is what we're saying. This is, again, this is one of the reasons we're so big on discipleship groups. It's in our discipleship groups that we see the family of God at work. It's where we do our learning. It's where we study scripture. It's where we do our, it's where we are family. It's where we bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. It's where we love one another just as Jesus has loved us. It's where we do mission together. And I know all of our discipleship groups participate in at least one mission activity every six or so weeks, but many do many more. So we pray for one another. So we eat with one another and grow in those intimate bonds of family. It's why, again, it's why we've oriented our church around these groups so that we can make disciples. You can't effectively make hundreds of disciples. That's why you see Barnabas, he makes a disciple out of Paul and out of Mark, who writes the Gospel of Mark. So Paul makes a disciple out of Timothy and Silas. And then when he plants churches, he puts leaders in charge and says, it's now your job to make sure discipleship happens here. So there's not one person who's trying to make a disciple out of 200, 500, 1,000, or even 50 people. But rather, we are all being discipled and all making disciples. This is the thing that Jesus commanded us to do. Our King Jesus said, make disciples. So it's not a thing that we say, okay, one day we'll go do that. We'll do that, we'll do that one day. We want to start doing that today. Verse 9 says, For you remember our labour and hardship, working night and day, so that we wouldn't burden you, we preach God's gospel to you. So again, this is what their life sharing and love looked like for them. They worked hard. They weren't pursuing comfort at the expense of making disciples. For me, I think most of our barrier to the kind of family we long for in Christian community is our pursuit of comfort. But not so for Paul and Timothy and Silas. They weren't cruising through life. They weren't dipping in and out of the community as it suited them. They were ingrained. They had woven their lives together in the community. That's how they made disciples. Paul goes on, verse 10, he says, You are witnesses, and so is God, of how devoutly, righteously, blamelessly we conducted ourselves with you believers. As you know, like a father with his own children, we encouraged, comforted, and implored each one of you to walk worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So, so here's where the kind of, kind of, if we kind of want to build a... Uh, want to build a model or or have a look at what does discipleship look like for you and for me? How can you today think, all right, this is how I'm going to, I hear the call, Lord, I'm going to be about making disciples. How do I do that? What does that look like? Let's look at them. They live as examples, he says. It says, devoutly, righteously, blameless conduct like a father. I think this is one of the reasons people don't... uh, pursue disciple making because they say, oh, I can't tell someone to look at me and follow me because not even, I can't even say, not only can I not say, look at my life and copy me, but I, I, I can't even, um, I'm not willing to become the person who can. One day I'll get there magically and then I'll say, 
follow me as I follow Christ. But I think that the time from now to there is much shorter for most people than you think. For you to become a disciple maker, I think the time, the distance between you right now and you being able to make disciples is much shorter than you think. Because you may have, I'm not trying to say all of you, but you may have been putting off doing the work in your own life to become someone who can say, follow me as I follow Christ. Not I'm perfect, be just like me. It says we lived as examples, devoutly, righteously, blamelessly, like a father. And then what did they do? So that's how they lived and what did they do? He said we encouraged, comforted, and implored you to walk worthy of God. So as they lived together, they modelled what it was like to follow Jesus. And then they said to them, come and let's follow Jesus together. That's discipleship. Discipleship is I am pursuing Jesus and I am helping others to pursue Jesus. We don't want to complicate it. You don't have to go and get a degree to become a disciple maker. You don't have to, you know, abstract yourself from community to become a disciple maker. Uh, you have people in your life today that you can start discipling. And you know what I find? I find it's better to not wait until you get there and then say, follow me as I follow Christ. But today, say to someone, follow me as I follow Christ and then live up to it. Yeah. Don't wait for it. Live, live up to it. Amen. They open up their lives. And this is the heart of discipleship. It's inviting someone into your life and saying, look at how I pursue Jesus. Look at how I spend my money. Look at how I love my spouse. Look at how I raise my kids. Look at how I apply the gospel in my life. Look at how I handle hardship. Look at how I work and pursue vocation. Come with me as I share the gospel. Be like me as I pursue Jesus. That's discipleship. And everybody can do it. It's, Jesus commanded us to go make disciples. I'm not trying to like, I'm not trying to heap something laborious onto you. It is a, man, it's a wonderful joy and freedom to be a disciple maker because you don't have to pretend to be awesome anymore. You don't have to pretend you've got it all together anymore. You, don't have, you, don't have, you can put all that aside and say, Come and see the real me. Let me show you how I follow Jesus as a person just like you. Disciple makers are not people who like float around because they are so sinless and blameless. They don't like shine um, because of you know, how much time they've spent in prayer and with the Lord. They are ordinary disciples who are making ordinary disciples. They just open up their life so it's not a guilt trip, but I do want to ask, how are you making disciples? This is a call for us all to live in the freedom we already have in the gospel. Because often the barriers to us pursuing this kind of discipleship and, and wonderful life, these barriers are actually the things that are preventing us from walking in freedom. We think this is hard work that's going to cost us and hurt us. It's not doing it that's costing us and hurting us preventing us from walking in the liberty of Jesus. Yes, we've been called to hard work, but it's the hard work that is part of joyful work in the Lord. It's a call to abandon living, trying to live like individuals, abstract, like discrete, compartmentalized lives away from community. And we might dip into community transactionally when we need it. I need support, I come to community. I feel like it, I come to community. No better offer, I'll come into community. Life's not great, I'll come into community. It's a call to abandon that way of life and come into the kind of community you were built for, made for. It's called to pursuing holiness with others, pursuing holiness in community. So being discipled and making disciples. We, ha we have to, it's a community project, disciple making. We have to do it all together. Otherwise, it'll be another stinking 20 years' time of preaching the same sermon and saying, hey, 20 years ago, I remember preaching at Cedarlight Church and say so we had to draw a line in the sand and say the next generation will not have the disciple-making problem that we have. 
We've got to do it. Let's pray together. So, Father, I want to thank you for your goodness and your kindness to us in Jesus. That we can be called disciples of Jesus. Loved by him, taught, taught by him. That he, he has come and made his home among us. Even becoming one of us. And so we need your help to obey his command to make disciples. I'm teaching them everything he's commanded, living with them, and laying down our own lives, laying down the pretense of a more put together life than we really have, laying down of our preferences and proclivities that prevent us from having the kind of life you have called us into. And so, Father, for each of us here and and anyone watching online, Lord, help us both to be a disciple, to open up our hearts to a father or mother or both or many and say, like the writer of Hebrews said, that we would remember what they've taught us, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith, not from a distance, but in family, And that we would likewise say to another, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And then, Father, help us to live up to that in how we love, in how we lead, in how we relate to others, in how we relate to you, in how we repent, so that we can be good examples. And, Father, help us to to obey this command that we would make many disciples, see many sons and daughters come into your family because of the work you're doing in us and through us in making disciples. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.